Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. Uh, I think this has been a topic that uh, ever since I started uh, my work career, and actually even before, uh, I'm an engineer background, has been a topic uh, fairly close to mind. So uh, coming from the private sector, because I think that's uh, probably slightly different uh, reflections than, than, than some of you have, even though both from what Yvonne and Jeremy said, I can see a lot of the same topics uh, are aligned between both public and private sector. But in the private sector, we always start with um, uh, some background around, and I just need to make sure that, yeah, uh, that why are we doing this? Um, and I think uh, multiple uh, studies have shown that um, let me just start with the first one, that um, what we get from a, a diverse background uh, is better results. You can always argue what are the, uh, what are the reasons behind it. Uh, my personal uh, view is that uh, if you get a more broader range of perspectives on a thing, it might actually take slightly longer to make a decision or come to an agreement because you do actually come from different perspectives, but you actually end up with better decisions. It's more robust, and I think particularly in um, fast-paced changing environment, having a robust 360-degree uh, view rather than a 180-degree view is extremely important. Also, I think it's been pointed to that um, diverse teams actually produce more innovative results. And then finally, I think it was a point that uh, both Jeremy and Yvonne pointed to, is that uh, when you fix a gender uh, diversity or when you start working on a more inclusive working environment, it actually becomes better for everyone, not only for uh, the gender balance, but also for the other diversity challenges that we might see around skin color, around sexual orientation, uh, simply around nationality and background. So actually starting to address uh, the gender diversity issues will also just create a more inclusive working environment where a lot of other people also will feel included. So where do we start and how does recruitment play into this process? Just make sure that we actually change. And what are some of the barriers that we see for it? Um, I think the first um, perspective is, um, just make sure we're on the same page here. Um, yeah, we go. The difficulties come from several things. And I think clearly, um, and, and that's been pointed to also in Yvonne's presentation, uh, the talent pipeline is an issue. And I think you need to start working on the talent pipeline uh, across from um, actually all the way from university, choice of university, and maybe even before already in high school. And I think especially coming from a STEM company, it's been important also to address that women are actually very qualified and quite necessary in order to do good IT. And I think that's something that's now slowly starting to change also in the universities. We start seeing both at the technical university and the IT universities that women represent 30 plus percent, not quite there, sometimes 27, but sometimes up to 40 percent, depending uh, on the um, specialization at the university. So work on the pipeline, I think, is, is, is an extremely important one. And as Jeremy was pointing to the work-life balance and the prioritization, and I think that's another key one to work on. And then finally, as Yvonne was also a lot pointing to, was the hidden biases. There are biases, we all have biases uh, to some extent, uh, and you need to start addressing them uh, also in recruitment. So being extremely practical, and I, I think uh, that's uh, uh, what uh, Nuna and I talked about, was what are we doing for this? Um, and I think sometimes it's something where you will meet resistance, as Jeremy was also pointing to, you will meet resistance and why we're trying to do this. Uh, and uh, especially um, a lot of the people uh, already in the company will start saying, oh, we want to just recruit for quality. But what we've started to do is always insist on diversity uh, in recruitment. So if I see a short list of maybe eight to 10, uh, essentially uh, Danish speaking white males, uh, I'll push it back and say, guys, uh, that might be the eight most qualified you found, but you've only been fishing in part of the lake. So go back and, and, and at least in the first list here, represent a, a list that's thought more largely around the job and the requirements for the jobs and get diversity into it. And it's not for um, 
not thinking about it. But when you're a leader that needs to recruit somebody uh, where a, let's say, 45-year white male just walked out the door and you want somebody who can fast fill that spot, it's fairly natural that you'll think about somebody who is a clone of whoever just walked out the door. So I think it's it's not by any kind of uh, by any kind of um, disrepresentation. A lot of times, especially in the IT world, a lot of this recruitment happens by network, and our network also seems to be biased a little bit against people who look like us. So I think from a recruitment perspective, you need to insist on seeing diversity into the uh, both first shortlist and second shortlist. The second thing we've been doing quite systematically is getting several set of eyes, uh, both on the advertisement. Uh, so that's kind of how does it read for somebody from the outside, but also in the interviews. And again, uh, that's something where we often get a lot of pushback because it takes time. Uh, it takes time when you insist on somebody either from a different part of the organization uh, or from a different gender needs to see that person and actually have real input. And oftentimes, again, like when you take decisions uh, early on, getting several different set of eyes on it sometimes make the process longer because you discuss more. Uh, but I think that's a uh, part of the issue. But if you're a leader who needs to fill a, a vacant spot, that can be uh, rather annoying or seen like a waste of time. And in the job interviews, we actually insist on trying to see at least one diverse profile. That doesn't mean we uh, necessarily give uh, the job to the most diverse candidate but we actually uh, also leverage this to push our thinking a little bit. Because the next time you might be looking for somebody like that, the next time you have to write a job interview, you might think back about saying, hmm, did I learn something from that interview? Seeing somebody who was just slightly different from what I was looking at, maybe I'll try to in include that in my next interview. And then tracking, tracking, tracking. What you measure is what you get. So uh, we try to track it. We try to compare internally who are good uh, at getting both diverse candidates into the recruitment pipeline, but also getting them through the recruitment funnel. And uh, that in itself is actually a, a, a great lever. Just start tracking and say, who can actually do that? Uh, because once people start saying, oh, this is actually something that the senior leadership is looking at, they actually start uh, also doing something about it. But I think also when you look at the flip side, uh, recruitment cannot stand alone. And I think that's extremely important. Uh, diversity is not a topic you can recruit your way out of. And I think you need to uh, start working also on some more general perspectives about uh, managing your career uh, and taking responsibility for that career, uh, both uh, in the company. So mentoring, helping women think through uh, how their career should develop how can the company support? And I think Jeremy, you had some great uh, examples from what uh, Cambridge is proposing um, and supporting that. Uh, and then finally, this is something you need to talk about at home and also that your career uh, is, is part of the equation and needs to go up. So a sharing at home uh, of the additional workload uh, that is part of having a family and having a home together, which is both about parental leave uh, at childbirth, but also during the child's uh, sick days uh, all through life. So I think this is something where you need to do quite a lot of things. And my perspective is always that this needs something that happens from everywhere. I think there is a legislation part of this about what government can do. And certainly in Denmark, we have been probably not as um, fast forward as our Nordic colleagues in terms of legislation that actually supports gender equality. Uh, so it's a little bit up to uh, a lot of the workplace also to make sure that this work. You need to build up the pipeline. You need to have role models. You need to put measures on it in terms of what you're looking at uh, in terms of di diversity and equal rights. Uh, and that can be about anything from sick days to parental leave uh, to um, how you look at uh, accomplishments. And then finally also, there is a big role for the women to do uh, because the uh, talk at home, you need to take that, uh, you need to take that throughout your career uh, and uh, actually uh, want to uh, choose this. No, no, I'm trying to not make uh, time uh, enough for questions also from the audience. So um, I think that was my key point. Recruitment is a core vehicle. It's important because you can measure it, but it cannot stand alone. This is something where you need to look holistically at your career. Uh, from a company perspective, and also work on retention, also work on your biases, also work on your policies. 
So I'll pause there and Nune, throw it up for questions. Um, thank you very much, uh, Eva. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, so Eva Banneke, when your search consultants get back to you with, you know, eight or 10 white Danish speaking males, then I guess it's not their criteria that are, are wrong, but maybe the criteria you gave them. Uh, and as you say, there are hidden biases um, in, in the leadership and that goes for you as well. You've told me you tend to prefer uh, McKinsey consultants and why is that? That is because you are a McKinsey consultant uh, yourself. So how do you sort of challenge your own bias? It's, cl it's clear that we all have biases. And yes, I have biases, uh, which actually might make it easier for me to make sure that we have women included because I'm a woman myself, but I also have other biases. So what I do is that I then uh, turn it around and say, then help me address my biases. Uh, so I tell the search consultant, that's fine, but then get me two candidates who might not match all my criteria, but which of the criteria that I put forward here uh, are the ones that block you from getting me a very diverse pipeline. And maybe those are two criteria that are not that important for me. We all tend to want to have the perfect candidate, uh, but then if we turn it around and say, which of the criteria we need to ease up on, uh, just as the example before from Jerry's meeting saying, maybe we shouldn't expect quite the same quantity in terms of publishing. Uh, is that the criteria you put up as a firm criteria? Then maybe remove it and see what you get. Hmm. Interesting. So there's a question in the chat for you. Uh, what metrics are you using? I think it's, a, it's an interesting one. one. One of the things is that we are measuring on recruitment specifically is actually saying which of, uh, of course, we measure our intake in terms of what's the mix uh, in terms of gender. We actually also measure it uh, on uh, nationality. Uh, because we are heavily Nordic company and we actually want to broaden uh, our uh, intake also to take non-Nordic uh, nationalities. So it's not only on gender, but it's also uh, on nationality uh, because we have a tendency to, again, recruit people who look like us. Um, so those are two of the, uh, the met metrics we measure. We measure it also on uh, age groups. So we also look at, do we diverse, do we recruit a, a diverse age group or do we also tend to recruit the ones that are similar to ourselves? Mm -hmm. So those are the things we, we measure. Um, and then we actually also measure both retention um, and uh, also uh, satisfaction uh, on both gender and nationality. So do we see differences uh, also in terms of what are my opportunities within the companies, uh, mm. what's my opportunity for internal recruitment. Okay, Eva, I'd like to talk to you about job postings because uh, as, uh, as, uh, as was mentioned in the beginning, all University has, uh, amongst other things, worked with the, with the job posting. And it was mentioned that, you know, words like analytical, ambitious, successful, competent, state of the, uh, uh, state of the art, etc., uh, maybe appealed more to men than to, to women. And I remember uh, when it was launched, it caused heated debate be, be, because a lot of women also said, well, you know, uh, I'm also analytical and ambitious and so, and so on. And, and these words uh, appeal to me too. Um, and state of the art was uh, was uh, being replaced with new or innovative or, or current to be uh, appealing to uh, to women. But what do you think about the words in job postings? Do they matter? Uh, I think it's now more or less uh, general knowledge that there are also gender biases in uh, how you word uh, your job um, uh, your job postings. Uh, and I think there's several softwares that actually allow you to work through, to, to put in your posting and say, hmm, what are some of the suggestions if I want to make this more uh, gender neutral? Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's not a hard thing to do. It's actually fairly standard now that you can do this. Uh, then whether you want to do it or not is, is more a question of, of willingness from that side. Uh, and it's clear that, that both within men and women, there'll be uh, differences. And I'm very happy that there are. But in general, you just see that less women will apply for a job which has this very uh, heart-driven, uh, performance-oriented, and also quite a lot of hard criteria. Uh, I think it's also something you've seen quite a lot that if you list 10 criteria, you'll, uh, as, as these are the things you need to do, which is typically for a job post posting, you'll see more male uh, who match maybe five, six, or eight, uh, and you'll see fewer women who actually, if they only match five or six or eight, will actually apply for that interview. 
tend to be a little bit more, oh, but I can't do all of this, so I won't even apply for it. So I think those are some of the, and, and you will find some will, uh, but uh, again, it's a gender bias that, that seems to eliminate a lot of the intake at the early stage of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I made interviews with, uh, with the four professors and one associate professor a year ago, and, and they mentioned, you know, they really had to, to, to convince themselves to do, do, do the sales work uh, when they applied for grants and so on. And it was a challenge to them because, because they, they, um, they weren't sort of, they just didn't like the process of, of selling themselves. And I, and I guess that's, you know, um, that's relevant to what you what you say. So, but but you know they got there and they and they it was a muscle they could train. Uh, so I think that's something women will have to work on themselves as well. Okay, so um, uh, th there's a final question for you, uh, Eva, in the chat. Uh, what questions do a focus on diversity within recruitment raise for leaders? Several, and I think it's something <laughs> that uh, uh, for leaders, I think. It raises a real question of also how do I want to evolve my team. Uh, it's of course very different if you already have a very diverse team, uh, because then I think it's a it's actually probably not even a, a, a non-issue uh, if you have a team that always is a very diverse from a gender, nationality, background thing. You tend to be quite open on that. Uh, quite a lot of different profiles can fit in. I think it's harder when you feel that you have a team with very specific and very narrow competences. So uh, let me say somebody who can uh, program uh, mainframe computers, you, you kind of narrow it into to, to a certain group. And there it becomes more difficult uh, where I let it get a lot of questions on these quite narrow uh, competences teams to say, but there are no women. There are no women in, 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 in mainframe because it's old technology, it's, it's not sexy and it's, it's a, so I'm like, well, Go and find the ones who get closest to it and see maybe if that will bring something else to the team. And I'm not necessarily insisting uh, on that it then becomes a, the diverse candidate, but I think it actually moves a little bit the barrier you have in your own head around uh, who can actually do this job uh, and what does it take. And sometimes we ask ourselves, and that's something we do also in our uh, graduate programs, it's kind of, can we then train somebody into this role? If we don't find a lot, do we need to take on a responsibility for actually training somebody into these kind of roles? So mm -hmm. what can we do in training SAP consultants, uh, good project management program leads uh, that come from a diverse background? Mm 